Greetings. In this video, we'll uh, rig the spring. Um, there are some new techniques, and so I'd like to start by uh, addressing those in isolation uh, or in, uh, with a simple example. Uh, the first is limiting the information. Let's, uh, before we begin, let's make sure that we uh, have our box completely rigged. We can pick this handle here, and uh, this represents the cylinder which has all of the elements of the box top uh, parented. We'll zero that out. Uh, our second handle represents the top of the box, which will rotate to and fro. And this uh, bottom one represents the cluster that has the four lattice uh, in the central part of the box, and we'll scale that uh, to make the box uh, breathe, if you will. I want to talk about limiting information. In the actual exercise, we'll have a locator that drives the spring, and we want to limit it so that we can't pull beyond it, can't push too low, can't go too far left or right, because we don't want the spring to penetrate the box. So we'll limit where it can go, and we achieve that in the attribute editor. I'm going to click the attribute editor here. I have my uh, cylinder, my box hinge selected. Um, and it drops us in the shape. We want to come over to the box hinge. Now, if your attribute editor tab wasn't available, you can always click the icon here, or you can come to Windows General Editor's Attribute Editor, or you can hit Command A uh, to open the attribute editor. Uh, I'm just clicking the tab. It's opened up the box hinge shape, and I'm going to come to what is really the transform node of the box hinge. Uh, down here is limit information, and uh, I'm going to limit the rotation uh, information. And why would we want to do that? Well, I don't want my box top penetrating. And if you're working very quickly, you might, you know, you might put it down, and or maybe you don't want to come over here and have to put in the zero each time to make sure that it's completely flat. So we can uh, limit that. I can put that value here uh, as our max. Because we're going in the negative direction, this would be a max. And then when we open it, uh, it's about negative 120, uh, fully open without penetrating the back of the box. And I'll click the arrow to insert that value and then click on the limit. So now it can only go between negative 120 and zero. So I can't go to 121 and I can't go uh, below zero. So when uh, either we're animating or we've handed it off to an animator, they can't inadvertently or mistakenly have that box stop penetrate either the front of the box or, or the rear of the box. So this makes it um, a lot easier to uh, be efficient for, for the animator. So that's limiting the information. In the attribute editor, down here to limiting, we limited the rotate 120 to zero. All right, one of the other new techniques, or relatively no, new, we did do some set driven uh, the first semester, but let me just remind us of that process. We're going to have a locator that drives the scaling of the joints to make the spring go up and down, and also the rotation of the joints to make the joints uh, move back and forth. That solves the mechanics of creating a spring-like um, mechanism, but it's not very easy or convenient to use. So we'll create a locator that drives the scaling of the joints and drives the rotation of the joints with a spline IK uh, in, in, uh, inserted in that rig. Um, let's first, though, talk just about, uh, I went ahead and put all my box items on, on one layer here. You probably had several layers. I've just reduced them all to one since I'm done with the box rig. And then I've just created some simple shapes here to demonstrate the set driven. I'm going to click on wireframe and uh, let's imagine this is a customer walking into a store and the store's door automatically opens. And set driven is used anytime you have a repetitive task. Anytime you want to um, recreate something again and again, it might be easier to do it with a switch or a dial or to have one object drive the attributes of another object. That's what we'll do here in this case. Um, in the animation mode, under key, set driven set, we'll open that. And note that we have driver and driven. The Z translate of my sphere, 
uh, this way, right, we can see down the z-axis, is going to drive the rotation uh, y of the cube. And so the sphere is my driver, I'll say load driver, and the cube is driven. So the polysphere, one of these attributes, is going to drive these attributes of this item here. And in this case, and just to make sure, right, we can uh, move that back and forth and we see that the translate Z is being activated. So we'll say polysphere one, translate Z. And here we have the cube and we determined that it was rotate Y to open that. And I just went like that and saw that indeed that's rotate Y to verify. Now, this word here, key, um, I encourage students to think of it as established key uh, can be confusing. You're thinking of keys. Uh, your experience with keys are here in the timeline. Uh, hitting the key here has nothing to do with the timeline. It is creating a graph that has values running both vertically uh, and horizontally. In a standard graph, right, we have values running vertically and we have time or frames running horizontally. In this case, in the set driven, we have values running vertically and horizontally. Though one represents the driver and the other the driven. And then as one is, as we select and change the value of the driver, it changes the value of the driven. And that's what we're establishing when we hit key. So I, I encourage students to think of this as establish. So polysphere one translate Z, we'll key that. And then let's just put this guy right to zero. We'll put it right in the middle. And then we'll pick the cube, and it's best if you move back and forth here. If you click out, you might accidentally click off. And sometimes when you click off, the attribute becomes deselected. So it's better just to go back and forth between your items here. So I'll come to the cube, and let's open that. Oops, I forgot to change the pivot. Let's do that real quick. I'm going to hold down the D key to be able to change the pivot. And I'm going to hold down the C key to snap with my middle mouse button. And we've got that there. Uh, yeah, and so let's rotate that open. We'll say 90 degrees. And I'll hit key. Now just with those two, let's take a look at what it did. I'll come and, right, when our sphere comes within 10 units, right, 11 doesn't count, 12 doesn't count, 13 doesn't count. We started at 10. And we can push that through. Now we can set a third one if we want it to close. So let's say when the sphere gets all the way to negative 10, we'll come back to the cube and we'll close the door. We'll put that at zero and we'll establish the key, key establish. Now we can move the sphere through. I'm getting a little penetration here. And so let's talk about that. We can come into the graph editor. Um, I could change the values. I could reset that third one. But let's, let's handle this in the graph editor. So here is my cube. And we can make this maybe a little faster. Right. So this is the rotate of the cube being driven by this value of the sphere, right? It was uh, at negative 10. Here's the sphere at 0. Our rotate equals 90. And then here's our sphere at um, positive 10. And then we have the rotate at 0. And hopefully that, yep, so now we're no longer penetrating. So that's set driven. Uh, I'd encourage you just to make two simple objects like this and practice uh, setting the key. That, um, that procedure or that um, setting the key, moving the object, setting the key, uh, it seems pretty straightforward, but the set driven key dialog box is very specific in the way that those keys are laid down. So give that a shot and practice it. I'll go ahead and hide that. And let's, uh, let's jump into the rig. Um, let me first talk about the joints. I'm going to come into rigging and create joints. And I'm going to start two units up. 
And uh, I noticed that in some of my lessons I've used eight joints, nine joints. Uh, I use either eight or nine. And then note that uh, for the midterm and the final, uh, students will sometimes create long 15, 20, 25 joint chains so that the jack-in-the-box can come out and kind of snake around. You can make that neck be as long as you want. But for here, we'll just do eight or nine. And we're starting two units up from the bottom, and I'm grid snapping. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'll go with nine. So there we have a nine joint chain. Uh, I can hit the shift plus to open all of those. And let's talk about uh, how we'll make this spring function. It's relatively simple. I can select all those joints, and with my rotate tool, uh, we can rotate. So that makes the jack uh, rotate back and forth. And then to make it go up and down, we're actually scaling the joints. And uh, this is on the X because the joints have their own local axis. And so you can see as I scale on the X, we're scaling those joints down. And that will create the appearance that the spring is uh, compacting and then extending. Uh, I'll put that back to one. Recall that rigging is always twofold. It is the mechanics of the rig, and then it's ease of use. So you might say, in this case, we've created a joint chain that gives us a spring-like rig. That's the mechanics of the rig. But it's not very convenient to ask the animator to come and fish around for these joints each time that they want to animate the, the spring. Additionally, having nine joints in your graph editor would, be, would be cumbersome. So we want to make this easy, and we'll do that in uh, two steps. We'll have a set driven that drives the scale of the joints, and then we'll use a spline IK to drive the rotation of the joints. And we'll plug those into a single locator, so that when the animator opens uh, the file, they can just grab that handle, push it down, move it left, move it right. And we'll also use that limit information so that we're not squishing too far, we're not pulling up too far, we're not going left or right, and that spring isn't uh, penetrating the box. Let's generate some geometry just to make sure, uh, uh, or to give us better visual feedback. I'm going to open my CV curve tool, and we're going to set this to linear. Right By default, it's cubic. We're going to just set it to linear. And I'm going to come up one unit over. And I'm going to grid snap, and we'll just go back and forth, uh, zigzag all the way up. If we were to revolve this zigzag with the hard edge, right, we'd have a hard edge uh, spring. What we'll do is we'll rebuild it, and we'll rebuild it to the same number of spans. Um, if we come into the curve shape, we can see that it has 16 spans. So in the modeling mode, I can come to curves. All the way down, make sure you're in curves. Surfaces also has rebuild, but we want to go to curves, rebuild, open the dialog box. We'll type in number of spans 16, and when we rebuild to the same number of spans, it just uh, softens that out. So that's an interesting technique if you want to use the CV curve tool in linear fashion and then soften that edge. Uh, that's a technique you can use. And then we'll, of course, revolve it. Uh, I'll go ahead and delete the original curve. And then we're going to bind. If you think back to the first semester, remember that we smooth bound our insect. Here we're going to smooth bind this uh, to the joints. I'm going to make my joints visually active by clicking this icon here. And uh, I'll shift pick that. So what do I have? I have joint one and revolve surface. And in the rigging, we'll come to skin, bind skin. I'm going to open the dialog box. Just hit reset. We'll hit bind skin. And then let's again verify the joints. We can pick them and we can rotate them. And so you see that that bound object is now deforming according to the joints. And I can scale, scaling on the X. So we've got the up and down action and we've got the rotate action. Uh, so we've, again, the mechanics of the rig are there, but we want to make it uh, easy to use. So what we'll do is we'll create a locator, and that locator is going to drive those scaling and that rotating. Uh, let's start. We'll say create locator. A locator, if we come and look at it in the perspective view, is just uh, looks like a jack, 
right? Uh, six uh, direction jack. And uh, we'll put this, uh, I'm going to move this up. I'm going to V-snap it uh, to this joint. And then we'll slide it out here. And oh, looks like I missed it. I'll just grid snap that right there. Actually, since this is on the grid, we can just grid snap it here. And uh, in the channel box, right, we've got some kind of arbitrary numbers here. We'll come up and say modify freeze transformations. So that zeroes that all out. We'll have the Y translate of this locator drive the scale of the joints. And then we can just pick it and move it up and down, and those joints will be automatically scaled. That'll give us the vertical action of the uh, spring. So we'll come back to animation, key, set driven, set. We'll say load driver, translate Y, right? It's up and down. And what are, what are we uh, driving? Now in our previous example, we just had one object. Here we'll pick all the joints, all nine joints, and say load driven. I'll select all those. And we established already that it was scale X. So the Y translate of the locator is driving joint one, joint nine, uh, scale X. So, uh, oops, and this came off, and I want to make sure that translate Y is selected. So we'll hit key, and then we'll go to the down position, which is negative 14 units from that, oh, let's see, I've got negative yeah, we'll put it there. We don't want it to squish all the way infinitely. So negative 14 is the correct. And then I'll reselect here. Remember that it's better to select here. And I'll come and type in 0.15. So squash down very much. And we'll hit key. Now I can grab the locator and we can pull it up. And that one locator is now driving the scale of those positions. And then here was the idea of limiting. So, right, I pull it up or I pull it too far down. This will make it confusing in the graph editor. If you have lots of negative values below negative 14 or you have lots of values above zero. So let's limit that in the attribute editor. Limit, and in this case, it's not rotate, it's translate. So our Y translate will be zero and negative 14 will be our limit on that. So negative 14 to zero, pull that up. I can't go any further, pull that down. I can't go any further up, down, up, down. So we're locked there. Give that a shot. Uh, you can practice that in isolation. I would even recommend doing it a couple of times just until you get the hang of it. Locator translate Y is driving all the joint scale X uh, attributes. Now for the rotate, it's a little bit more tricky. We're going to use a spline IK. A spline IK can be thought of as a curve deformer. In fact, the spline IK itself isn't selectable. It generates a curve and then we can manipulate the CVs of that curve uh, to create a really snake-like um, rigging animation. So let's execute that. We'll come to rigging. Last semester, you used the create IK handle uh, for the legs of the robot, for instance. Here, we've got spline IK. Spline is another word for a curve. Uh, I'll click create IK spline handle. And we'll click at the bottom, and I'm not holding the shift key, just clicking to the top. This is a confusing IK handle initially, because you can see I've got the IK handle selected, but there's no transform available to me. It's really the curve that was created that controls it. If I pick this curve, and I move the curve, the entire rig is moving. Let's take a look at two panes side by side, and I'll make those both the orthographic uh, front. And in this view, let's only look at the curves and CVs. Zoom in there a little bit. So I can grab a CV. Let me just review. This curve, curve 2, was generated by this IK handle spline. 
So the spline IK handle generated this curve, which is actually controlling the joint chain. And you can see I can move that around, and you get a real nice snake-like or tail-like um, deformation. That's just that uh, vertice there. I could grab this one, right? You can grab uh, both, and you could rotate them and get some interesting results, right? Uh, moving that back and forth. So some real organic um, kind of snake-like or tail-like or rope or hose-like uh, applications. In this case, uh, we're using it for our spring. There's uh, one, two more steps before we get back to um, the set driven of that locator. One is we don't have to, we don't want to have to fish around for this curve. We don't want to have to fish around for the vertexes. So I'll click and um, let's get back to object mode. I've got that selected as an object. And uh, we're going to right click. Curve point um, is a little unique. We see we've got holes, edit points, and control vertexes. Those are components. Then of course at 2 o'clock we can switch back to object mode. Curve point isn't a component. Curve point, uh, the language might be better said, uh, I'm pointing at the curve. This is where I'd like to point at the curve. And you're using this most often to cut or attach a curve. So if you want to cut a curve, you can use curve point. Uh, if I clicked right there uh, and went up to detach curve, the curve would be broken there. Or if I had multiple curves and I wanted an attached place in a particular uh, area, I could use curve point. But we're going to click and drag to the top. So, right, I just went to curve point, click on the curve, and drag to the top. And we're going to create uh, what's called point on curve, and that will give us a locator. And that locator will drive that particular vertex or vertice in this case. So I'll say point on curve. It doesn't appear as though anything happened. If we look in our outliner, we can see that locator 2 is selected. Um, if we come and make the, oh, let's make this one our perspective, and we can see it there better. There's another uh, jack that was just uh, just created. I'll go back to the front. And so how are we going to put these two together, right? We've got this locator out here, and just to review, right, that gives us up and down. But when I move left or right, it's not, uh, it's not driving anything. So we will constrain the spline IK locator to our master locator. And remember that when we're constraining, you're picking the boss first and the subordinate second. So this is our main locator. We've got it selected. I'm going to use the command key to skip select down to locator 2. Right? Oh, and I've, I've, I've skipped a step here. Sorry. Uh, locator 2, the pivot is still down here at the bottom. Let's go to Modify Center Pivot. And let me just verify. I don't even think I, I showed you. Uh, now we can move that back and forth. That, right, we created a spline IK. The spline IK gave us a spline or a curve. We said um, point on curve, pulled it to the top, and then came to deform point on curve. That gave us this new locator 2. Uh, we centered the pivot, and then now I can move that back and forth, and we get the rotation of the joints that we're after. But I don't want to have multiple locators. We want this to be the boss of everything. So we'll pick locator 1. Uh, I'm going to use the command key to skip select, right? If I hold the shift key, I'll get everything. I don't want that. So locator 1, the boss, when we're constraining, the constraint er is selected first. Oops, and the constraint E selected second. And we'll come to constrain parent, constrain parent. Now when I pick this, it's right, that locator, locator two, is following our master locator here, locator one, and I can also push it down. So we can go this way and that way and push it up and down. Now we've got a problem here. Uh, I'm going to hit undo. Now when we pull it down, we get um, some scaling overlapping, and we'll uh, correct that in the graph editor. Uh, so pull this down uh, until you get that kind of funny flip. We'll open, uh, we'll select all the joints, um, and then we'll open the graph editor. 
All of our joints here are selected. And all I need to do is pull this handle out with the shift mouse button uh, until that uh, opens up. Now, if your handles are locked for some reason, right, my um, handles are free, you can also right click and pull down to weighted tangents. And that will allow you to pull. Uh, if you have non-weighted tangents, you can't pull on it, and it would look like this. Uh, I, I am selecting it, but I can't pull it out. Right, Move tool, shift key, middle mouse button. I'm trying, but it's not even letting me. So right click and go to weighted tangents. Here you see the little square rather than the rectangle. I can select it and oh, make sure you've got them all. And uh, I need to make sure I have them all and I need to make sure that they're all weighted. Select them, shift middle mouse button, and right, we're relaxing this part of the curve, which means that they're not, uh, their scaling isn't running into each other. Now we might need to pull, we, we just want to pull enough, so I'm going to test it here, and indeed uh, that's working up and down, so we don't have that funny uh, twisting. Let me undo that, and let's just tackle that again. Uh, pull this down to where you see the flipping, select all your joints, draw a bounding box so that you know you have them all. If you don't see a square here, you are in non-weighted tangents and you can't pull it out. So with all of them selected, right, bounding box, right click, pull down to weighted tangents, you'll see the square. Make sure you have the move tool grab this handle and shift middle mouse button, slide it out until this pops uh, back. And you don't want to go too far because then that'll affect the overall animation, just far enough to where that relaxes. And then you want to test it uh, just to make sure that that is not flipping. And then the final part of the spring specifically is our, is our limit uh, information, right? Because I can pull, uh, oh, I already limited that one, right? So let's limit the, the side to side. So I'll need to bring my box back for this. And we want to be able to see, let's go to our standard four view. I'll bring back all of my information. Let's open the lid. All right, we'll open it all the way up. We limited that information so I can just pull that. And I can see uh, with my locator I wouldn't want to pull it further than about there. And so in the attribute editor, uh, and this is a translate, this is translating, uh, and let's make it a nice even number. Let's say negative 12. And so I'll say that that is my max. And then this way would just be positive 12. And we'll uh, hit that, whoops positive 12 and so we've got negative 12 and positive 12 let me just zero this out and we'll start uh, clean so I can grab this and push can't go any further than that can't go any further than that so my spring isn't penetrating and I can't go any further than uh, up and down but I can grab it and we can just very quickly uh, be able to set keys on that and get a nice uh, spring-like function. And then to get your locator back to standard, it's as simple as zeroing that out. Okay, final thing, we're going to create just a temporary head. Uh, our next exercise after we finish a practice animation will be to model our first generation head. Uh, for now, we're just going to create a very simple version uh, of a head that will allow us to create a squash deformer and we'll talk about constraining that. Okay, so let's go to create curve tool, CV curve tool. We'll open the dialog box and hit reset. We want to be working with the cubic. We'd set it to linear to create the initial spring. Um, we'll come up and just create a very basic head. I'm grid snapping right on the central axis. I'm grid snapping the second vertice out so that we have a smooth transition across that axis when we revolve. And we're just going to make a nice shape here, grid snap that last one. 
hit enter and we'll say surfaces uh, revolve. I'm in the modeling mode, surfaces revolve. Um, I can get rid of that initial curve. And then of course I also want to surfaces uh, reverse. Now it's very common um, question to ask why we simply don't parent the head uh, to the joint chain. Um, we are going to constrain, and let me let me demonstrate the problem with parenting and then the solution uh, that we have via constraints. When we parent something, the translate, rotate, and scale are all given over to the parent. So we pick our child first, in this case the head, and if we parent it to this joint, I'm using command key and we'll pick joint 9, uh, the translate, rotate, and scale of the head will be given over to the joint. I'll hit edit parent. And uh, we can see that this follows, right? If I go back and forth, that follows. But if I push it down, you can see that it's uh, squashing. And that's because our joints are scaling on the X in order to drive the, the spring geometry here, in order to drive that down. But we don't want the head to scale. Uh, so we don't want to parent all translate, rotate, and scale. In fact, we just want it to follow, which would be translate, and we want it to rotate. Uh, and in our constraints, we have the ability to just have uh, point constraint or translate, orient constraint to rotate, and then we don't uh, uh, add the scale. The scale is left off. And so that scaling of the joint doesn't affect our head at all. Um, I'm going to unparent it, so I'm just going to pick that head and come to Edit, Unparent. Now what can be a little confusing is when we're using that standard parent method of Edit Parent or hitting lowercase p, um, you pick the child first, which is the subordinate, and you pick the parent, which is uh, the, uh, the in charge node, right, and hit lowercase p. When we're constraining, it's the opposite. You're picking the constrainer first, or the boss, and the constraint E, uh, you're picking that second. So the boss is uh, joint nine. We're picking that first. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna command select our revolve. And uh, I wanna demonstrate something here um, about pivots. So I'm gonna come to constrain in the rigging mode. And let me just show you. So parent gives over all three. A parent constraint is a little bit different than going to edit parent. Uh, we'll discuss that further on in the semester. Remember that we uh, parent constrain this locator to this locator. Um, but we have point, orient, and scale. Point represents translate. Orient represents rotate. And then, of course, scale is scale. So if you did a point, orient, and scale uh, constraint, that would be the same as parenting, because parenting does all three. So they're separated out. So let's first add the point, and there's going to be a mistake here. I'll hit point, and where did the head go? Well, it went up. The pivot is what gets constrained. I'm going to hit undo, and you can see that the pivot point for the head was down here. So I need to, before I do the constraint, I need to move that pivot um, to the base of the head. So I'll, I'll come back. I'll pick that head. The D key allows us to change the pivot, right? Uh, let's say we I'll just bring it up here in the general space and then if we hold down the V key I can snap that right to that joint so I snap the pivot to the joint so when we constrain it there's no offset right with that pivot down at the bottom we constrained it and there was a great offset there so now this this head the pivot of the head right if I move that over you see that it's right at the bottom um, and I got it there by holding the D key and positioning it, and then I was very precise by holding the V key and snapping it to that joint. So let's try this again. Remember that the boss, the constraint er, is selected first, uh, and then I'll select the constraint uh, E, uh, oops, sorry, which is down here. So the joint first, the boss, the constrainer, the head second, which is the subordinate or the constrainee, and we'll say constrain point. Uh, doesn't appear as though anything happened because that pivot is was at the exact or is at the exact same place as the joint, so it didn't jump, didn't move at all. And now we can see that it follows. Uh, and if I go down, you see that it follows, and it's not deforming at all. It's not scaling, um, but. 
when I push and execute the rotate on my joints, the head isn't rotating at all, right? Um, which is kind of uh, funny or interesting, but let's make it also follow. So I'll pick the boss, joint 9, shift select the head, head which is the subordinate, and now we'll do orient. Now when we come and check, the head is also rotating. So I can just grab this and we can shove it down, we can move it left or right, and that head is following, but when we push it down, right, this is squashing, that, that um, spring is deforming, scaling on the X, remember, from 1 all the way down to 0.15. But because the head is not scaling, right, the, the head is not now going to be deformed by those joints. We just gave that joint 9 uh, a point constraint over the head and an orient constraint over the head so that it follows and rotates. Uh, I'll put this back to 0. And then the final step, we want to have uh, a squash deformer. Uh, so in our deform for the head, we're going to come and go to deform nonlinear squash. And uh, squash deformers are fun. Uh, and it's the factor here, so you can see we can uh, we added that squash deformer. Uh, I'm in the inputs of the channel box. Uh, I've selected factor and with my middle mouse button. I'm scrubbing uh, right to change the value of the factor, which in real time is now uh, squashing my head. But there's some funny offset here. We want the squash deformer to take place from the bottom. And let me I'm going to just pull this out so that we can see it. Uh, here is the squash deformer. This is the top boundary and the bottom boundary. Uh, I'm going to and so what we want to do is put the the middle uh, at the base of the neck, uh, right? Because when we're when we're squashing it, uh, it's squashing from way down here. Let me bring that back and just demonstrate that again. This circle is where the deformation uh, center is. So if I grab that, you can see that it's right, giving us this funny offset. So I'm going to hit undo. And I want to move the squash handle, right? You can see, look, take a look at it here in the outliner. And I'm going to, I want to move it up and have the center also be where this joint is. So I'll hold down the V key and we'll just snap it. I snap the center of the squash handle to this joint position with the V key. Uh, snapping to joints as a vertex or point snap. So now we can take a look at the factor, and you see that it's squishing and squashing from the bottom, uh, which is where we would want that to occur. Um, and then we'll take the low bound. I'm going to hit the 4 key so you can kind of see that low bound. Uh, we'll pull it up, and then we'll take the high bound and pull it down. And we'll just check to make sure that was OK. And you can see that that's working. So there we got some squash uh, on our head. If I, uh, the squash deformer is separate, right? It's not automatically added to our rig. So you can see here as I move back and forth, that squash deformer is left behind. And if the geometry is not sitting in within the boundary of the squash deformer, uh, you get a funny offset from that. So all we have to do in this case uh, is parent it to this. Now, um, Scaling the squash deformer isn't going to have any effect on it. So we can indeed pick the squash deformer, pick joint 9 second, and come and parent it. And now you'll see uh, it follows, right? It follows our chain. So if we were off on this position, I could grab the squash deformer, and we see that it squashes from there as well. When I drive it down, the fact that it's scaling a little bit isn't going to have any effect on the actual uh, deformation. So we just did a standard parent. Okay, this is the complete Jack in the Box exercise. The next set of videos go through some animation strategies, and I'll create um, some uh, a brief video explanation of that in the next video. Uh, questions in the discussion forum? Uh, have a good one.